Hey everyone, welcome to the Darkcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Miley. The Darkcast is supposed to be a bi-weekly discussion about video games and the news and issues surrounding them. The show is divided up into multiple one-on-one conversations between myself and the various writers here on DarkStation.com. Unfortunately, this episode is about two months late. We had a great Games of the Year series of episodes, and I took a break over January because it was exhausting. Uh, Then we ran into some recording issues when we first recorded these segments, Uh, so I had to re-record them, then I moved, then I got sick, and it's now, now. Um, So they're finally all edited and here, so sorry for the delay, but uh, I hope you enjoy these segments. In section one, I talked to Brian Tyler about the Platinum Trophy in Marvel's Spider-Man for PS4, and about how... um, actually prevalent it is compared to other platinum trophies. In section two, I talked to Joel Zerlup about his first platinum trophy. I'll let you guess what game that's for. And in section three, I talked to Jonathan Paris about Battlefield V and some of the disappointment and lack of conversation surrounding that game. And in section four, I talked to Alan Kessinger about the PSVR, which is turning three this year, and about some of the good games that are out there for it, and some of the stuff that we're excited for for the future of virtual reality. You can find the timestamps for each of these sections, as well as more information about the things we discuss in the show notes for this episode. You can find all of that on darkstation.com. There you can also find the Darkcast Interviews podcast as well as video game reviews, previews, and features. Be sure to subscribe to the show on iTunes, follow us on Twitter at darkstation underscore com, find us on Facebook, check us out on YouTube, and email us at podcast at darkstation.com. As always, thank you so much for listening. Now on with the show. Welcome back to the Darkcast. I'm Jonathan Miley. Joining me today is Brian Tyler. That's right. Uh, noted uh, Spider-Man enthusiast. That's right. Spider-Man extraordinaire. Uh, yes. Some might call you Brian the Spider-Man Tyler. Sometimes Mr. Uh, Spider-Man I've been known as. Yep, yep. 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 Yeah, all those things. But for uh, copyright purposes, it is Spider-Man all spelled out one word. Correct. No uppercase letters. Uh, no dash. For, for anybody... Uh, that was wondering <laughs> about exactly that. yeah yeah it's very it, um, it keeps me out of trouble with both Marvel and uh, um, you know like Wayne Newton. <laughs> um, so I uh, just I guess before we get into this, we're we're gonna be talking spoilers. We're talking about uh, the Spider-Man Platinum Trophy, which is uh, for a AAA game pretty high up there in terms of percentage. Uh, but I guess for anybody that has lived under a rock for the past however long and doesn't know what the Spider-Man game is, uh, Brian, you reviewed it. You reviewed all the DLC. I did. Uh, give us a quick just like rundown of what the game is, what you really liked about it, that sort of thing. Okay, uh, so in, in Marvel's Spider-Man, let's, we'll get proper titles going here so there's no confusion, um, you yep. play as the titular character. Um, you, uh, both Peter Parker, um, also, you know, we've got Miles Morales in there, uh, MJ is there, uh, a number of, uh, evil villains, um, and then as, as Spider-Man, you are, uh, saving the day, saving the city of New York, uh, locking bad guys away. Um, the swinging is excellent, um, the combat is really nice, um, the story was fantastic, um, all in all, I gave it a 5 out of 5, it was, uh, it, absolutely superb, and... And it just, um, if, if game of the year, absolutely, um, for a number of us on the site, Mm -hmm. um, if you have not played it, uh, you should play it. Absolutely. That is, uh, if there's, if you just like turn off the podcast now and you're like, these guys are crazy, uh, you should listen to this one thing, go play Marvel's Spider-Man. Absolutely. Phenomenal. Absolutely. If you have not, uh, 
If you have not played it, you should play it. It is it is a great game. Um, and honestly, if you've played it, you should play, play it again. again. Absolutely, they've yeah. got a new game plus mode, which is fantastic. Yep. Uh, I'm not saying you have to go through it on ultimate difficulty. I'm not saying you're, you you shouldn't, uh, but uh, you should definitely definitely do but it again. There is the uh, trophy for that, so there it's is, an option. So it yeah, is an option. It is not? not necessary for the level of trophy we're talking about tonight to get the platinum trophy. Uh, but I mean, if you're already doing 100, percent you might as well just go all the way. True. True. Um. So so what we're talking about. Uh, is Spider-Man had, when it first came out, I want to say, uh, you know, like two weeks after launch, uh-huh. the Platinum Trophy was at like 20%, which if anybody listening knows anything about Platinum Trophies, that is an insanely high number. Yes, it especially is. Especially for a AAA game. It is uh, a I've, ridiculously high number. I've done some research, and there are plenty of games that actually have a much higher uh, percentage, mm-hmm. uh, like 70 to like 90%. But a lot of those games are, from what I've read, like made so that you can get a platinum trophy, uh, which is yeah, it, it's basically really like those, weird. Those games exist for only that reason. Yes. And they, that their level of quality shows. Yes. Um, and, uh, yeah. So when you, when you look at the, uh, the triple A space or even just like the, higher tier indie space uh platinum trophies dip down very quickly and now uh spider-man is sitting around nine percent and i would attribute a lot of that to you know two weeks into the game you're talking about a lot of early adopters people Mm -hmm. that pre-order the game people that bought it you know day and date and so those are going to be your quote quote unquote hardcore gamer people like us and yes. uh, I would expect it to be higher when you're just pulling from that uh, pool of, of people. But now Black Friday has happened. Christmas has happened. Um, you know, the, the Boxing Day has happened. That's right. Martin Luther King Day has happened. Plenty of reasons to, to get this game have happened. Yes. And uh, so... Numerous sales. Yeah, the, the Spider-Man version of the PlayStation 4 was on sale constantly throughout the holidays. So, like, big, totally understandable that that number would go down. Yeah. Uh, but 9% is still quite high. Yeah. Uh, looking at some previous numbers, actually, uh, Sony, uh, around the time that the PlayStation 4 launched, uh, Sony released a list of the top, uh, platinum games for the PS3. Okay. Uh, this really has no bearing on anything else that we're talking about right now, and I don't have the numbers for them uh, because they didn't publish those for whatever reason, and I assume they're going to be different now from when they were originally released. But number one on the list was Assassin's Creed 2. Number two was Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2. Number three was Uncharted 2 Among Thieves. Then we've got God of War 3. Then Resident Evil Five, mm-hmm. then the original Infamous, mm-hmm. then Uncharted One, Drake's Fortune, God of War, the remake on the God of War HD collection, yep. Borderlands One, okay, and yes. rounding out the list, Sly Cooper and the Thievius Raccoonus. Heck yeah, I have, from I the, have uh, a Sly collection. A number of those. I want to say I have something like thirty. Um, and I, I, but no- that's a lot. I've got I've got five, and it's it's weird. Four of the five are insomniac joints. Uh, one of them <laughs> is Sly Cooper. Trophies. They do. They do. Uh, Sly Cooper Two is one of them, mm-hmm. and then I've got Ratchet and Clank: Crack and Time into the Nexus, the remake uh, for the PS4 that they did, and then Spider Man. Which the remake of Ratchet and Clank required me to play the game three times, and I literally played that game. Th- three times successively without playing anything else in probably the span of a week or two. And I loved every moment of it. That is impressive. Uh, Because as you said, they know how to do achievements. They do. It's it's really funny to look back at uh, when they first started making achievements for, you know, the Xbox 360 and the PlayStation 3. They were crazy and they were terrible. Uh, Sometimes, you know, it was really awful things that they made you do. Uh, or I, I can't really think of any specifics right now, but the most egregious thing that any game can do, and they don't really do it anymore, but they did it all the time back in the day, 
and that was not stacking difficulty. So if you play a game on the hardest difficulty, well, sorry, you're going to have to go back and play it on easy and normal oh, to get God. those achievements or trophies. Oh, and that's just yeah, so that's bad. The worst. Oh, man. That is, uh, that is if a, you've got the medal to play a game on the hardest thing. difficulty, you should not have to replay it on a lower difficulty to get an achievement. That is ludicrous. Yep. Yeah, correct. As we kind of alluded to before, Insomniac knows how to make achievements. Um, yes. The original Ratchet and Clank games were ported to the PS3, and they have some terrible achievements. The first yes. one, you have to get a billion bolts, or a million yep. bolts. I don't remember which. And that is, Way too many. It's a billion, and it's terrible. And the second one, it's two million bolts. Yeah, I, yeah, I actually stopped it's, uh, partway it's, through Ratchet and Clank 2, and I was like, I, I, I had the... Um, you know, I've got, I've got the, I still have the, 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 the collection somewhere. Mm -hmm. Um, it's on my shelf somewhere, but yeah, no, I, I, one took such a toll getting that million bolts that by the time I was a couple worlds into two, I was just like, I can't do this anymore. Yeah. And I had to put it down. It, and on top of that, the, the level of quality for the PlayStation three ratchet and clanks, um, was kind of just such a band more, um, that kind of going backwards, into the PlayStation 2 ones mm -hmm. was really kind of was really very eye opening. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. But um so I I have the plans for the the 3s and I do have the platinum for that first Ratchet and Clank, but man that that just took all of it out of yeah. me. Yeah. But that that wasn't done by Insomniac. They didn't port those games. Yeah. No, it wasn't. And they're they're actually really good about instead of making just these ridiculous goals for you to get in the game using the achievements or trophies um I I started with an Xbox, so I, I call these stupid little things that we get in video games achievements all the time. So uh -huh. apologies if anybody is offended by my word usage or anything. <laughs> um, but uh, they, they do a really good job of using them to kind of point you to what all is in the game rather than yes. you experiencing all of the game before you have all of the achievements, which I think is a yep. very smart and a very good way to to use achievements, to, to more than just be this currency, this thing that we say, oh, I've got this score or I've got this level on PSN or whatever the case may be, uh, to actually use it to kind of enhance the game and say, hey, you know, you can look at your achievements or trophies list and look at the things we're asking you to do Yep. And maybe go try something that you wouldn't have tried in the video game before. Yeah, and a lot of those, especially with the Insomniac ones, they come. Uh, a lot of them just come from experimenting and from having fun with it. Um, there's the trip mine one where you have to like attach a, a, an enemy to an enemy five times. Yes, and that's how, and that's those like figuring out ways to do that is uh, is super neat. You know, finding cool ways to use your gadgets and then getting rewarded for that on top mm -hmm. of it by getting. Uh, getting a trophy or getting an achievement, that's the kind of stuff that, that, that is good. That's good design. Yeah. So, um, and then also, you, you know, just ones for, for exploring, for going out of your ways to finding stuff. They had uh, a hidden one, which I'm not super cool with the, the random hidden achievements mm -hmm. that aren't story related. Um, but the hidden, there's a hidden one to find um, Uncle Ben's um, uh, uh, gravestone. Mm -hmm. And like you could swing through that entire city and never think to go look in the cemetery that's at the northern tip of it. That that's where Uncle Ben is, bar is buried. But unfortunately, due to events in the story, um, you end up in there at one point we, uh, towards the end. We already gave a spoiler warning. It's cool. Okay, yeah, <laughs> you know, with you, Aunt May is buried right next to Uncle Ben, and that's that's kind of cool that that's like shows up there. And that just for being there, you know, not only do you finish the story, but hey, if you take an extra second to to pay your respects, suddenly you've got one. You've got one uh, there. Uh, Batman uh, Arkham City. Um, it had one very similar to that, where you and if you uh, find your way to Crime Alley, oh, yeah. uh, which is in Arkham City, and you pay your respects as the the camera circles Batman as he kind of kneels down next to the roses that he places uh, where his parents were shot. Um, if you wait there for the the it circle all the way around, um, you get a trophy pop up. So just you know, kind of doing the human thing mm -hmm. and and getting doing yeah, granting that moment proper respect, uh, it nets you you know just a little boost, a little bonus. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm I, I'm with you. I don't really 
care for it when achievements like that. I, I totally understand if it's a if it's a story uh, related achievement, and knowing the name or the you know the line underneath it could reveal some kind of spoilers about the game. Totally understand not wanting to have that visible, and if it's something that you're just automatically going to get while playing the game, totally makes sense to have it hidden. Uh, but yes. stuff like you know finding Uncle Ben's grave. Um, or the trip mine one, like that's one I'd gotten to the end of the game and I had to go and look at, okay, I've got these yep. two things that are hidden left. What are these? Um, and I had to figure out what it was because I, like, I didn't use the trip mines a whole lot. And so it had never really occurred to me to, to use them in that manner. Uh, but that's actually something that the DLC uh, kind of in some ways pays service to if you yes. haven't used your uh, different gadgets, gadgets a whole lot, mm -hmm. then you would most likely actually get that achievement during the screwball um, challenge where you have to yeah. use the the little levitator platform and the... And the trip mines. Trip mines Those yeah. are the only two gadgets you have access yep. to for it. Absolutely. Uh, so that, that's pretty neat. But... Uh, but yeah, it's 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 pretty weird to me just that, you know, Spider-Man has such a high uh, percentage of platinum trophies. Uh, like I said, we're sitting at about 9% right now. Other popular recent games, uh, Horizon Zero Dawn, uh, which has been out for longer. So again, you've, you've got more time for people to have gotten the platinum trophy, but then you yeah, also... Yeah, I mean, that's almost two years now, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. but... In addition to having more time, you've got more people that are not interested in getting a platinum trophy at all. Um, so I guess that kind of balances each other out. But that's sitting at about 8%. Uh, the new God of War, or as I like to call it, God of Four, uh, <laughs> is sitting at about 5%. Uh, and then you've got things like Uncharted 4 that are at 0.7%. There you go. Yeah. Uh, that's, you know, that's... Um, that's a very low number. And that's what I'm used to seeing in, like, most of the games that I play is a Platinum mm -hmm. Trophy with, like, a sub-1% uh, achievement rate. Uh, but that also, you know, it makes you feel really good because then it tells you some achievement that you got, like, halfway through the story is rare uh, because yeah. <laughs> 0.7 people actually got a Platinum. Yeah, people, yeah, people so did, that means only, like, 4% even made it through the game. Um, yep. But, uh, but yeah, it's, I don't know. Like, I don't feel like there's anywhere to go necessarily with this conversation that plat that, um, Spider-Man has such a high ranking, uh, platinum trophy, but I do think that it's, it's just interesting that it happened. Uh, I think yeah. part of it has to do with, uh, like we were talking about the, the E, not the ease, uh, but just the way that Insomniac has done these achievements so that you don't have to get a gold in all the side missions or anything like that. Yep. There's even a whole, there's the secret photo ops throughout the city. There's 50 of them where they reward you with a new costume for completing those, but there's not an achievement for it. Yeah, there's not an achievement for that. Not at all. And in fact, um, like that costume is actually really great because it's not, there's not even a spot for it on the costume mm -hmm. list. So there's it, literally, you are doing that. Um, for no reason other than to just say, hey, I'm having fun swinging around this city. I'm going to grab all these extra points that come up from this extra gadget. They they do a fantastic job with uh, with that kind of design. And on top of it, playing the game is fun. So it makes, I think, it speaks to the amount of people who did not want to put the game down yet. That they felt that they were they still wanted to go through and, and complete everything that um, Insomniac had put in there for them. Yes. Yeah, and I mean, like, uh, and just to speak to it, I would. That was Joel's. Joel actually got a platinum in this, correct? Yes. Yeah, Joel Zerlo, yes. uh owner, CEO, editor in chief of the site. Um, yeah. This was his first platinum trophy, which uh, I cannot think of a more fun game to do that in. And yeah, no, I, I think, yep. I think your your point there is totally right. That. <laughs> It, the game is just a lot of fun to play. And I even when I went back and did my new game plus on it, um, mm -hmm. I went and did all of the 
uh, the towers throughout the city, which you know unlocks the uh, the map. So that's a functional thing to do. But I also just yes. went through and got all the backpacks again. <laughs> I already had the achievement, yep. but I just I just wanted to swing around and and collect crap, uh, which you know that's that's really what the collectibles in Spider Man are there for is to make you feel like you're being somewhat productive while you're just swinging around the city. Uh, and it, it's great at that. And I, I think it's been uh, conducive for people to, uh, you know, to swing around and have a good, you know, usually relaxing time, uh, but then also get some sense of satisfaction of either getting achievements or getting uh, unlockables or whatever the case may be kind of while you're doing yep. it. Yeah. Yeah, all in all, you should play this. It, you play this game. Yep, yeah, just we're just coming back to that. We said that at the beginning. Yeah, play <laughs> Say it again. Exactly. You should yeah, play we'll, Spider Man. We'll right, right back around. You should be playing Spider Man. If you have not, you should be playing it right now. Absolutely. Play it while you listen. That's a that's a good idea. Open world games and podcasts. Skip, skip the part that really had well. the spoiler part in it, but you know, skip that <laughs> and just play it while you listen. And then go back and you know, and then you'll get the joke. It, it wasn't really a joke. We're not yeah. a joke. It's not a joke. I, I made no joke yeah. about that happening. Yeah. And I'm not going to say it again because you should be playing it now. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Well, Brian, thanks so much for sitting down with me and talking about Spider-Man as well as a bunch of other random stuff that may or may not end up in this part of the podcast. Uh, we'll be back in just a moment to talk about more video game stuff. As Mr. Spider-Man, I will see you on the other side of the web. <laughs> Welcome back to the Darkcast. I'm Jonathan Miley. Joining me for just a few moments here because uh, Brian and I were talking about why Joel got a platinum in Spider-Man. And you know what? It's probably best just to ask Joel. So first, Joel, how are you doing? I am great. I am happy to be back on the show when it's not Game of the Year talk. So I feel like this is like... <laughs> me too. It feels like liberating in a little bit. And now I'm like <laughs> sort of nervous because I'm being talked about. And like people are now speculating of why I platinumed a game, which is kind yep. of odd. But uh, mm -hmm. excited to talk about Spider-Man, a game I have not been able to talk about much on the show yet. So yeah. Well, so Brian and I were just, we were talking about how much we liked the game, yeah. and Brian has like 30 Platinums, I yep. have five, Okay. and then it came up that this is your first mm -hmm. Platinum trophy, mm -hmm. and I, I, don't, I don't think it necessarily has to speak to the quality of a game, because I know there are plenty of games that you absolutely adore, and mm -hmm. you haven't gotten a Platinum in it for mm -hmm. one reason or another. But I don't know. I'm just kind of interested in what drew you to, you know, you can finish a, a campaign and be done with a game, but what made you put in the extra couple of hours or however long yeah, it took yeah, yeah. To, to get that meaningless little trophy that goes on your PlayStation ID? <laughs> so, so the lack of a platinum is not... Uh, because I didn't want a platinum. In fact, there have been many assassins. Actually, I'll just say many Ubisoft games that I have attempted mm. to do a platinum, but for one reason or another, I just peter out. I think, um, I guess I should back up a little bit. Spider Man was, and shockingly so, on a year that God of War and Red Dead Redemption 2 came out, uh, and Assassin's Creed Odyssey came out, was my game of the year last year. I, um, would never have guessed that, uh, if you had told me that going into 2018. So I, I think I will start there as I, I just, I loved everything about this game um, from the story from, I mean, there's no one, I don't think there's anyone on the internet. I think the hundred percent of the internet agrees swinging in Spider-Man for the PS4 from Insomniac is just beautiful. <laughs> it is just mm -hmm. the best feeling in the world. And to be honest, that might be the reason I got a platinum in this game. I just, I loved everything about this game. I think the mechanics are just flawless. I uh, I think this is like a more honed-in version of the Ubisoft open world, and I think 
those things just all combined into something that made me just want to invest in this world in a way that I just have not done in other games. Um, Spider-Man, it, it, this is also my first exposure to uh, Miles uh, Morales, um, which I loved. I absolutely loved just when he was introduced. I loved the setup for potential next game. I think all of that stuff is just super interesting. I, I, I loved the whole story for this game, so that kept me going. And I loved the side stuff in this game. I thought all of it was rewarding. Um, whether it be the camps that you go to, I thought were great. Um, all of the collectibles were fun to get because it had you just swinging, and that's the best part of this game. It's just, yep. I don't think I ever fast-traveled. Um, no. Except you get the trophy for fast-traveling. For fast-traveling, yeah. I mean, Which I... <laughs> yeah. I saw that it was, you know, ride the train five times. So I would swing around, see a train, and then land on it and ride <laughs> it for like 30 seconds. And you're like, and then do it I again. And I was like, it? wait, yeah. I've, I've, like, I've done this 10 times. Why why haven't I gotten this trophy? And I looked it up. It's like, oh, you have to fa- – why would I do that? But I will <laughs> say those segments where you fast travel are great. They're they funny. Um, as someone who now takes the New York uh, subway every day, I find them amazing. And also, <laughs> have you why... seen anybody dressed up as Spider Man on there? Uh, no, I have not. Uh, but I will say also, I want to know what train he's riding because there's not a not, not a lot of people on those trains, and that is not <laughs> New York subways. Um, they are crammed in like sardines. But I, I think everything, you know, and that actually brings up probably the last reason why I platinum this game is it takes place in New York and as a now nine month resident of New York city um, swinging around the town. I now live in uh, actually gave me a very nice appreciation for the town I live in. And it actually uh, it's funny because I can see spots from Spider-Man that I'm now seeing in real life for the first time, which is super, super cool. Um, And of course I went straight to where I live and tried to see how they recreated this area and the area I work in. Um, and Soho and like all that kind of stuff was just super cool to see in the game. And I think, you know, from the story, visuals, swinging, I like the side stuff. I thought, and I think it's an attainable platinum. Um, it's not mm-hmm. a game that is going to kill you to get the platinum. I think a lot of Ubisoft games that I've tried to platinum in the past, um, have been just monsters to try to get. I think the hundred percent completion of Spider-Man is attainable and it's not, 100 hours it's more like 30 and i think that helped a lot um so yeah uh, i just love everything about this game and it actually pains me to say i have not gone back to the dlc which i feel somewhat guilty about but i feel like i had such a complete experience i don't know if i want to go back even though brian uh, (laughs) raved about him well, we have our, me and Brian have our own conversation, which will either be in this episode or the Perfect. next one about the DLC. Perfect. Uh, there are some issues with it, so if you don't mind spoilers, maybe check that out before you check out the DLC. Perfect. But uh, that is awesome. I'm I'm glad that you enjoyed this game so much. It was also my game of the year. It is so good. And, and Brian's, I imagine, if I yep, remember correctly. And, yep. and Alan's. And Alan's. Wow. Uh, it was it was yeah. a bunch of people's. Yep. Uh, and it totally deserves it because it is fantastic. Yep. Uh, but okay, excellent. That's you know, everything that you said makes total sense, and I think you know the, it's kind of just an extrapolation of the way that I've thought about the collectibles in the game, and it, it's really all of the side content in Spider Man is an excuse just to swing around the city more and feel like you're actually accomplishing something because the game is telling you to, but really you're just swinging around the city. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's kind of what the trophies are an excuse to do as well. Yeah. I mean, even the, some of the um, time trials and stuff like that, like I didn't love them, but they were swinging. So I was still okay with it. And I'm like, actually like some of the ones where you had to get like, cert- I forgot what they were, but like you had to get to certain things in a certain amount of time. I, mm-hmm. I actually kind of liked it cause it made me better at swinging. And I'm like, Oh wow, I can actually go even faster than I was going. And it's, um, it all just went to what makes that game so special, which is you are Spider-Man and you are swinging through New York City and it is awesome and they can continue making those games and I am so into it. And it actually, I think the last thing I'll say is uh, how did this game not get made like a hundred times already? I feel like this wasn't like this high-minded concept. It was like, we're going to make an open world Spider-Man game where swinging's awesome and you haven't done that since the PS2 and like you had mm-hmm. like 10 Spider-Man games in between there that, that couldn't figure that out it doesn't seem like a high-minded concept but man insomniac just 
nailed it. And uh, I can't wait to see what they do next because there's definitely going to be something next. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it's it's a crazy concept because multiple games have talked about bringing back the swinging mechanics from Spider-Man 2, mm -hmm. uh, from Spider-Man Web of Shadows to the Amazing Spider-Man 2, um, and I think several others, and they never have, like, remotely gotten close to the swinging that was in that one. Right. Uh, it's it's kind of insane. But, Absolutely, uh, yeah. But we've finally gotten it, yeah. hopefully. So... All right, well, awesome. Joel, thank you so much for, for sitting down with me and chatting for just a moment about Spider-Man. Uh, again, if people haven't played it, you definitely should mm -hmm. go play it. Uh, that is, it is why it got my Game of the Year nod, because it's, it's the game that if you only play one thing from 2018, you should go play Spider-Man. That is absolutely the case for me. So go do that, and we will be back in just a moment to talk about more video game stuff. All right. Welcome back to the Dark Cast, everybody. I'm Jonathan Miley. Joining me today is Jonathan Paris. How are you doing, Jonathan? I'm doing pretty good. How about you? Doing well. I'm doing well. I'm excited to have this conversation here uh, because it is something that I've wanted to have for a while. Uh, because it's something that I I find interesting. Uh, that's we're talking about Battlefield Five, but um, I have Battlefield One, and that's like the I have that the two Bad Company games, and then the original 1942. Those are like the only Battlefield games that I have. Uh, but I picked up Battlefield One because. It just sounded super interesting. I played the either the demo or the early access, whatever thing on EA Access, and thought that the uh, kind of approach to the single player was really unique. And I especially loved the beginning of the game, where every time you die, you see like the, the, the person's name and like the like I think it was the like like a tombstone, like the year they were born to year that they died. I think yeah. it's been a while since I played it, but. Um, and then you would just like warp to somebody else and keep playing and it's just like it just feels like you're in this like pointless battle in a way because you're not making any progress for it every time like you sort of make progress that character dies and then you move to somebody else and it just it seemed really cool uh, I never actually got around to playing the rest of the game because um, that happens with far too many games <laughs> um but I was I was mildly interested in Battlefield Five coming out because it it seemed like it was going to be kind of the same thing, in you know World War Two instead of World War One. But then it comes out, and when Battlefield One came out, like a lot of people talked about it for a long time after the game came out. But Battlefield Five was released and like just dropped off the face of the earth. Yeah. Almost immediately. So what what's up with Battlefield Five? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say I think that uh. Well, EA just recently came out and they said that their reason for Battlefield 5 quote unquote failing was because of a uh, pushback release date and the game releasing without the uh, Battle Royale mode that's been talked about so much. I think that is part of the reason as well, but I think if you look. I didn't even know it was supposed to have a Battle Royale mode. So interesting. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's supposed to uh, apparently have a Battle Royale mode that I believe is supposed to be coming out um, soon. Actually, I think next month. But. It was highly anticipated. They were talking about it. They were, they showed off a few. Uh, they showed off like a, a, a trailer for it. Then they say it's not coming out at launch. It's going to come out about six months later. So that was a big thing. It kind of set people off, of, especially when you look at Battlefield's main competitor in Call of Duty, which has the battle royale and is really the main focus of the game. And obviously, the battle royale hype is a is a big thing that's going on now in the gaming. So that, along with the um, with the announcement that they cut the premium content, um, the previous Battlefield games had what they had called Battlefield Premium, which is basically you pay fifty extra bucks, which it was expensive. But you pay fifty extra bucks, you get all the DLC, you get um, weapons and uh, experience, and this that kind of stuff. Stuff you typically would get in a premium version of a game. But they cut that this year, and it was supposed to be a good 
PR thing, like everything's free, we're releasing everything free. But I think when that happened, they used that as an excuse to cut a lot of the content at launch and just release it over time as opposed to just having most of it come out at launch and then release DLC packs uh, every few months. So now I don't like their 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 um I don't like their business strategy with how they release the game. I think that's part of the reason why it failed because it's bare bones at launch and the, you get the gotcha. you get the majority okay. of people at launch and people buy the game. There's no battle royale mode. Their maps aren't coming out yet. Some of the weapons aren't out yet. And I think that set off a lot of people, especially when Call of Duty actually came out with a, a good release this year. Mm-hmm. But it, Which I think surprised a bunch of people yeah. because when it was first announced, it. I don't know. I it didn't sound like too many people were happy that it was going, you know, no uh single player straight multiplayer uh mode. So I think it was kind of a, a pleasant surprise for a lot of people. Yeah, I was definitely surprised uh for me cuz I'm not a, I've never really been a huge Call of Duty fan since Call of Duty 4. I actually started playing Battlefield and that got me um away from Call of Duty. When I was playing Battlefield okay. games, uh Bad Company 1 was actually my first one and I've played all mm-hmm. of them since 2, 3, Harline four one and five, and um, Call of Duty last year when it came out it, it was it was panned. Uh, when it came out with I think it was Infinite War or whichever one had Joss. Uh, no, la- last year was their World War Two one. Um, just what it, Call of Duty World War Two was the World War Two one. Okay, well, I think it was the one before. Well, it was the same. It the one before the same. that. One. So. Oh, that was uh, Infinite Warfare. Okay. That was the. Uh, the one in space, which is the the only Call of Duty game I've actually bought since Modern Warfare. <laughs> okay, yeah, so that one came out the same year as Battlefield <laughs> no, 1. It, yeah, it was yeah. received pretty negatively uh, when, they, yes. when it was announced. So, naturally, everybody looked at the other competitor in, in Battlefield 1, and Battlefield 1 was doing something a little bit different, uh, going back to World War... Uh, going back to the World War One, as opposed to all these other mm-hmm. games doing Future Warfare. So, Battlefield 1, like you said, was pretty well received. People were excited for it. And then Battlefield Five, fast forward two years later, and she was on other foot. Call of Duties came out right. and it's doing great. And then you look at Battlefield Five and it has no content. At least in my right, which is it's interesting. The the year before, uh, the year between those, uh, basically, is when Call of Duty World War uh, Two yeah. and the the off year for the Battlefield games, which is the Battlefront games. <laughs> right. um, we had Battlefront Two come out, and that had like that obviously had a huge like hoopla that we're still hearing about wow. with with stuff as far as the uh, the microtransactions. Yeah, the uh, the loot crates that you get in the game, and you know investigations to whether that's illegal or not. Um, and it's kind of it's crazy that like we still hear stories about that today now 2019 uh, 13 14 months after the game was released uh, but like I don't I don't know it, it's interesting because there besides the controversy of Battlefront 2 there wasn't a lot of conversation about Battlefront 2 or World War 2 like I feel like people just kind of accepted them because that's what they got that year mm-hmm. um as opposed to, like you said previously, everybody kind of shifted away from Infinite Warfare towards Battlefield 1, and then now uh, shifting away from Battlefield 5 to uh, Black Ops Three? 4? Four? Is that the one that we're in? I think, yes, I think it's 4. God, there's there's way too many numbers in this. I, <laughs> yeah. I hope I got all those right. If I did, I'm surprised. Um, but... I don't know. It's it's just kind of interesting to to watch like the the ebb and flow between those two franchises, which have kind of played off each other in a lot of ways. Um, it is kind of interesting to look at, and it seems like especially on YouTube, there's a lot of people that are really angry about Battlefield Five um, for a couple of reasons, and one of them are people that are are mad because it's not quote-unquote historically accurate Mm -hmm. um, because it's got, you know, women in the the army and people with, like, prosthetic limbs and stuff like that, which, one, there there were women that fought in World War II, so it's not historically inaccurate. Uh, There's actually... I I need to see if I can find it. There's an interesting video that I did find. One of the reasons that people are kind of dissatisfied with the way that um, Battlefield V represents the war is not because it's... it's actually historically inaccurate is that it's different from the way that we normally see that 
part of history mm-hmm. um, retold. Uh, so basically, we get comfortable with one form of history, whether or not that's you know true to actually what happened. And so, if you hear something or see something that is different. You know, and maybe it's more true to history, but if it's different from what you're used to, then you that's uncomfortable. You don't exactly. like it. And, you know, women in World War II, that's not a thing that we're really you know used to seeing in media or anything like that. So so there's that. Uh, but then there's the other thing of uh, apparently just a couple of weeks after the game came out, uh, there was a big like EA origin sale and the game was like half off. Yeah. Yeah, it's thirty bucks. People got really pissed about that, and um, so I I didn't get Battlefield Five, so I I can't you know say anything about that game. But a very similar thing happened with Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Mm-hmm. Uh, that game was it, reviews came out. People were saying it was amazing. I was kind of I was really worried about that game because all of the trailers leading up to it were very combat focused, mm-hmm. and that is my least favorite part of those games. Like, I want the game to have good combat, obviously, but I want to solve puzzles and raid tombs, mm-hmm. not shoot things. Exactly. Um, and so I wasn't going to get it, but then, like, everybody was talking about it, and I, I just had to. So I picked it up, and I'm not a big fan of it, and that's neither here nor there, but very soon after it came out, within a month, it was 30 to 50% off. Yeah. But you know what? I'm okay with that, because I'm I'm the one that chose to buy it at launch or to pre-order it. Mm-hmm. And I cannot stand when people get upset when games go on sale or drop prices soon. Because if you buy a game at launch, like you, you you're taking that risk that it could drop in price very soon. And you need to be okay with that. If you're not okay with that, don't buy games at launch. Like, very simply. Like, I never recommend other people pre-order games. I pre-order my fair share. But I never recommend, like, normal people do that. It's not a good habit for people to be in. Because games can be broken at launch. And that's another thing that, you know... I, I think some of the issue with the backlash against Battlefield... And this is this is one thing that Call of Duty definitely does well. Is they released like relatively bug free very polished experiences. Yeah. Ever since Battlefield 3 came out cuz they you know they do their beta thing like a month before the game actually comes out which is like I understand it as a promotion. That's all it really um, is. I I, I recently uh, played uh, The Division 2 and it's quote unquote a, you know in beta but it's coming out in March. That's that's not a beta. Right. Exactly. Like that is that is a pre release demo. And that's that's okay. Like I, I understand what it is. But the thing is, especially with Battlefield three, that game was janky like a month before it was released and that was the quote unquote beta. It comes out and is released and is janky. Yeah. Battlefield four comes out, same thing. Janky in beta, very close to launch, gets released, still janky, bugs have to be ironed out. Um, and I haven't really heard the the consensus from people, but I'm pretty sure that's probably the case with Battlefield Five and with Battlefield One, especially with multiplayer. Uh, so I, I think some of the unrest in the Battlefield community is more or less just stuff that has been like simmering or like you know starting to boil over for years now, yeah. and is finally just kind of starting to boil over the the edge. Um, but the, uh, but what I was going to say, you know, don't, don't pre-order games because, you know, they, they may drop in price. They may be broken at launch or, you know, if you wait, you may get the, the game of the year edition that has all of the DLC for the same price as the, the full game or less. Like you just, it, you can't get mad because the game goes on sale. You're the one that chose to buy the game at launch. If you don't want to make that choice, then don't. It's simple. Yeah, I feel the same way. I kind of feel like if you um, if you buy the game at launch, you're also paying for a price to pay it to play it day one when it releases. When the game comes out sure. to sale, if you're getting it a half off, you're probably playing the game a month or month or two, a few months later after it's already came out. So of course you should get a, a discounted price. The game is technically not new anymore. Right. 
So yeah, yeah that's. So uh, so yeah, both of those those issues, like I I have issue with because I feel like they're they're dumb. Like, don't get mad because your your game has women in it, um, and don't get mad because a game went on sale when you paid full price. Um, I've heard people use the analogy of like, you know, if you if you go into a a restaurant and you you order a nice meal, and you know you're there at like, say dinner at the restaurant starts at six, you get there at six. Uh, you, you're paying your check at the end of the night. Everything's full price. You see somebody else come in. You've been there for a few hours. It's maybe eight o'clock, nine o'clock. Uh, somebody else comes in. They order the exact same thing you did, and they get it for half off. Yeah, <laughs> because it's not new anymore. It's not new. Like that. That I, right. But that's like that's food. Like food is generally cooked to serve, right. especially in a, a a nicer restaurant. But like that's a ridiculous like analogy to make mm-hmm. with video games like that that does not work um you know especially when when you're the first person to or the first group to buy a video game in a lot of ways you're in that same category of people that wait a that buy like an iPhone when it first comes out instead of waiting a few generations or waiting six months or, or whatever the case may be. Like you're, you're part of that initial buy-in group. Early that adopter. The only, <laughs> yeah, the, the early adopter, exactly. You're the reason that that game can get to a critical mass and be a mass success and reach the you know, normal person. Right. And so part of what you're paying for when you're an early adopter is one to say that you you played it early, you played it the day it came out. Um, and part of it is like I don't know, it's it's a it's a weird relationship that we have with media when you're an early adopter, you're basically paying the company to help promote their product by being one of the people that bought it. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. If you don't want to do that, then just don't. <laughs> don't buy the game and launch. Um, I don't know. That's that's one of those things. I don't know why it gets under my skin so much, but it it, it does. So I, I guess I just needed to get that off my chest for the second time. That's <laughs> if, if you really think about it, games are actually cheaper now than they, than they technically ever been. Oh yeah. It's. I mean, with inflation continuing to go up, as it always will do. Yeah. Um, a sixty dollar game now versus a fifty or sixty dollar game twenty years ago is a way lot more. Cheaper. Well, well, yeah, way cheaper. You are right. Than it would have been way back then. So and and also, I mean, there's we actually have like a uniform pricing scheme. I mean. You know, obviously there are games that try to sell you on, you know, their season pass and the digital deluxe extras. And, you know, there are games that you can pay more than $60 for. But for your average AAA experience, everything is fifty nine ninety nine. Mm-hmm. And back in the, like, early 90s and especially in the 80s, like, there was no uniform price for games at all like there were games that were like 90 bucks yeah, exactly. and that's 90 People bucks forget that. then <laughs> it, yeah I, I don't know I, I feel like in some ways like video like we've grown up with video games in such a way that we are entitled to them now which because of our relationship to them it, it's kind of come back to bite us like this uh I don't know, we've created this cycle of being reliant on games and expecting games to be a particular way in terms of like w- when we buy them and how we buy them. And when big developers, big publishers, not, not even developers, uh, but when publishers like learn what we expect and how we expect it and take advantage of that, then we get all upset because it's a bad system that essentially we helped create. Exactly. Yeah. I don't know if that makes any sense. Uh, or not. I, 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 <laughs> like, 
Oh, man. So, uh, are, are you playing Battle uh, Field 5 now? Uh, I haven't played it in maybe a few weeks now. But, okay. Uh, I, were, I was playing to get until uh, I started getting really big into Gwent, <laughs> like I was saying okay. earlier. Okay. That's that's a, that's a little different of a game. Yeah, I play, play. Every, play, play a little bit of everything, <laughs> but I just got into a huge car game mode. Nice. I've only been playing that. Week. Okay, cool. So, so what would it take for you to get back into Battlefield Five at this point? Maybe the maybe the Battle Royale mode. Once it comes out okay. uh, next month, I'll check it out. Kind of see what they're uh, what they're doing with the Battlefield touch on the Battle Royale is, mm-hmm. and maybe. Maybe that'll get me back into it, but honestly, I'm looking forward more for uh, Bad Company 3 whenever that comes out. I'm I'm almost to the point where I don't want to play Battlefield anymore until they release Bad Company 3, because I think that's what Mm -hmm. all the fans want for the most part, and they know it. It's just a matter of them coming out with it, and they actually said something that kind of set me off uh, about a year ago in in reference to Battlefield Bad Company 3. Yay, excuse me, DICE came out and said, they don't want to make a Bad Company 3 because they don't know if they can make it better than Bad Company 2. Mm. And that, that that was a pretty weird statement to come out and say. I, so, we'll see. But hopefully the Battle Royale for Battlefield 5 is is uh, worth me hopping back into the game. But if not, I'll be waiting until Bad Company 3. <laughs> well, well, hopefully you don't have to wait as long as everybody did for Half-Life 3. So, um. don't wait. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, any uh, any final thoughts about uh, Battlefield Five? Uh, not really. Just hope they turn it around because I am a huge Battlefield sure. fan, like I said, and I don't like to see the series going down this route. Yeah, I understand. Well, Jonathan, thank you for sitting down and chatting with me about Battlefield Five. We will be back in just a moment to talk about more video game stuff. All right, thanks for having me. Welcome back to the Darkcast, everybody. I'm Jonathan Miley. Joining me for this segment is Alan Kessinger. Hello. How are you doing? Pretty good. How about yourself? Doing well. I'm doing well. Uh, Darkcast is is returning. I had to take a, a little bit of a break um, because of Game of the Year stuff. Mm-hmm. That was... Uh, I, I want to say that I, I bit off more than I can chew, but I don't think I did. We did everything and it was successful. I just had to mm-hmm. take a break for a little while. <laughs> sure. Well, and I figure, too, you want to take some time to sit down and start planning Games uh, of the Generation podcast, right? Uh, that's gonna be a little while. Um, that that broke me of basically uh, doing anything with video games for like yeah. two years. So yeah, uh, yeah I, don't, I don't know if I'm gonna do that anytime soon. Um, but uh, you know, speaking of of generations, no, that doesn't really work. Uh, you know what? It is PSVR is almost three years old. Yeah, which is cool. It is very cool. Uh, and it's something that we actually talked about on uh, the Game of the Year podcast. Uh, mm-hmm. People want to go back and check that out. Uh, we were discussing, you know, one of your favorite games, Astrobot Rescue mm-hmm. Mission, mm-hmm. Um, and my newly acquired desire to actually get a VR thing because, uh, like I said then, and uh, unbeknownst to me, uh, one of our other writers, uh, Mark Steinger, uh, mm-hmm. went and wrote an article which basically said the exact same thing that I was saying, that VR is kind of accumulating that critical mass, and it's mm-hmm. it's something that you could actually say, yeah, like, go get one. It's worth having. Not just because it's the newest thing or because right. it's this gimmick, but, like, it's a viable way to experience games, and there are games that are unique and you can only experience mm-hmm. there. And, you know, it's it's funny, too, because I think we're seeing more of a uh, we're getting more of public opinion on it because you're seeing places like the void or spaces showing up 
in malls or here in California at downtown Disney, where you can go in and have like a 15 minute VR experience. Granted, it's more than what you're going to get at home. They strap some, they, they will strap like a little backpack and, and sensors on your hands and feet. And you're actually walking around an environment, but I mean, it is still VR Mm -hmm. and you know, it, it's, it, Kind of when I first heard about it, it kind of made me think, boy, I remember when they tried to do stuff like this, like in the 90s, and it just never took off. But, you know, for the first time, the technology's there. And I think it's 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 definitely reaching that critical mass. I, I see it. And I think it's just getting into the hands of the people more and just people becoming more aware of it than before. Right. And personally, I I think a lot of the reason that VR is, is kind of finally starting to to take off is because of the PlayStation VR. Yeah. Because with you, like your the specs that you need for to to run it on your computer oh are ridiculously high. Right. At at my at my day job, we we I applied for a grant to get VR and um you know, the Luckily, they actually sent us everything that we needed. They sent us a computer. They sent us um, all the equipment and everything like that. But I have to imagine that setup. In fact, we get that question a lot from people trying it out. Um, that setup probably has to cost at least $1,200. Because, I mean, you've got to have a, a fairly high-end computer. Mm-hmm. And plus, the VR equipment is very right. expensive. I mean, the Vive is, what, $600? Um, the Oculus Rift is probably around that same price. I haven't checked in a while, but what's great about PlayStation VR is if you have a PS4, like you're halfway there, right? Like you don't need to get any, you just need to get the VR unit and you're good to go. Granted, you may have to buy, um, move ones and, and, uh, um, but I'm, you know, you can get those online. I'm sure at a discount, but I mean, it's ostensibly cheaper, much cheaper and the setup is way easier uh, than having to do with uh, having to do all the stuff for PC. Now, I mean, there's a caveat, you know, the, the thing about PC as it's always been, it's been the wild west of, of, you know, game software. I mean, you can get all sorts of stuff. Whereas, you know, PlayStation four being a little bit more closed, you know, you don't get to try the really weird stuff. You don't get to try the, um, you know, hyper realistic anime girl dating virtual sim, um, that you could get on PC. But the nice thing is, it's like Sony is kind of, has been paying attention to like what does well. And, you know, they, they tend to kind of pick the, the highlights or, you know, the popular stuff from PC and bring them over like Beat Saber and Drunken Bar Fight. Mm-hmm. Agreed. But I, I think it's it's both the, um, like you said, if you've got a PlayStation 4, you're halfway there. It's the mm-hmm. cost effectiveness of it. So the, the mm-hmm. Vive is four ninety nine by itself. And there's mm-hmm. actually a new one coming out, Vive Cosmos, which I don't, I think it's got uh, like Wi-Fi and I'm, I'm not sure what all oh. is, is oh. part of that. Mm-hmm. Um, but Oculus is three forty nine for the mm. the regular one, and then apparently there's a an Oculus Go. Yes, uh, which yes. I Those... assume is based on like the Samsung VR technology you know, or something. We we received those, and it it pretty much is cell phone VR without having to put a phone in. Gotcha. Okay. And the battery sucks on that, mm. especially when it when it you're trying to recharge it. It takes a long time to recharge. Sure. But yeah, it, it's it's basically. I mean, the the it's running off of some version of Android. Gotcha. I mean, so it's it's pretty much yeah, send some VR. Uh-huh. So I mean, you've you've got those. But as far as being able to make this a product for mass consumption, mm-hmm. like the the PlayStation is the the easiest to get into. Absolutely. And I haven't tried any VR headsets. I look forward to doing that one day. Mm-hmm. Uh, but from Everybody that I have talked to, the PSVR headset is by far the most comfortable. It is very comfortable. Um, the HTC Vive is very comfortable. Um, it is a little front heavy, um, but it is it, by far, I think it is is certainly the most comfortable. And PSVR is 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 very yes. I mean, it's it's very comfortable. I don't have issues. I would have liked a little bit more padding, like the HTC Vive, but. 
I'm not really complaining. I mean, it it is a very comfortable headset, especially if you're playing some of their games where you're wearing it for an extended period of time. Mm-hmm. Cool. So we've talked about uh, Moss. We've talked about Astrobot. Mm-hmm. Um, what are some of the other games that maybe are a little less well-known uh, that you think are are good games to, to play on the PSVR? Um, you know, there it, it's funny because I, I want to say that when PSVR started, there were a lot of like, I mean, there there was definitely a move to, to prove that, yeah, you could play video games with this. It's not just kind of sitting and like watching a film or like I, I remember Everest VR tried really hard to kind of be a edutainment, um, but didn't quite come off as either fun or like. I mean, the, the interactive parts were, were kind of half-baked at best, and then the rest of the game is basically just like a museum-curated piece. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you've got stuff, well, let's take these um, full-game experiences from on the console and put them in VR, like Skyrim. Um, so here's, you can play Skyrim in, in uh, basically what I thought that would just mean is that they're just going to lock you into playing the uh, first person camera, uh, but they actually went in and they they made some really like smart tweaks to 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 make it all work. And you know, you, in a game like that, you really do get to see the limitations of the PSVR as far as um, graphics wise. I mean, if you're a real hound for that stuff, the PSVR is probably not going to be like it's probably not going to satisfy you um especially since it tends to have a sort of like screen door effect when you kind of put it on it kind of with some of the stuff it kind of looks like you're looking at a picture through a mesh um mesh screen door mm. um but with Skyrim you know outdoors you could really sort of see yeah okay maybe this doesn't look so great but once you get indoors you really do get like a really nice kind of sense of like wow i'm actually in the jarl's um you know throne room in in white run or you know i'm really exploring this cave um and then you get um you get games like farpoint where it's sort of like an exploratory um adventure where you are like it's kind of like the the auto diary the uh, audio diary stuff where you're you're kind of interacting with this environment but the real story is being told through these you know sort of holographic recordings of a crew that that got to this uh alien planet before you um but what i found to be really awesome that really takes advantage of the PSVR are games where you are exploring like derelict space stations. Um, the ones that I can call out immediately are red matter and um, horror sta- uh, downward spiral horror station um, where it's just you alone in this space station that has suffered from some events. Uh, um, <clears throat> and your job is to pretty much just kind of go around and turn stuff on. And it's great because it appeals to the like, what I love most in video games is being able to push buttons and like interact with the environment in ways like that. Like, Hey, here's a coffee cup. I want to pick that up. Why? Because I want to, Hey, here's a button. I'm just going to push it. It doesn't do anything, but I don't care. Um, as far as VR as being able to kind of immerse you in a place that's different from your own, it's really Mm -hmm. cool. And it's, and it's perfect for it. And, um, those those really became my favorite games to look for on on the medium. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So, is is there anything that has been announced and that you are excited for? Um, I mean, what I would really like to see though on the platform is um, Google has this fantastic art program called Tilt Brush. You can get it on Oculus. You can get it on um, Vive, but it is just a simple art program but it is very robust and you can do a lot of stuff with it it has a lot of fun brushes you can you know take pictures of the stuff that you've done you can take videos of the stuff you've been doing um i'd really like for a um i'd really like for like an art program to to kind of come out for it because you know i i think that would be really neat and that's certainly a great way to introduce people to VR, especially if they think they would be um, 
suffer from motion sickness mm-hmm. uh, because that's that's definitely one of the things I've I've certainly had some VR games that have that have tested the the limits of my ability to not throw up all over myself. <laughs> um, but with the with the grant that we have at my day job for VR. Um, that's usually like the first thing I I do with because you can you can stand you can sit it'll still work you can still take full advantage uh, advantage of it but um, yeah I think I think if if that were to come out or if that word were out that that would be being made for the VR I would be I would be happy about that for sure I'm I'm looking <laughs> I'm looking at a list here of PSVR titles and mm-hmm. um, again like I feel that. Sony does a pretty good job of like, hey, let's see what looks let's what looks interesting, what's generating buzz. Um, other times, I think they just kind of like go for broke and let people design stuff. Um, there's two games in particular that um, are kind of I don't want to say weird in a bad way, but it's just a, like they're interesting. Let's say that. Okay. That, that doesn't have any negative connotations at all. Um, the first one is Megaton Rainfall, and that is a first-person VR game where you're essentially Superman, and you're okay. flying you're flying around the Earth like fighting off aliens. But what's nuts about it is that I don't know if they're pulling from Google Earth or what, but it's a pretty um, close approximate uh, approximation of the land masses on earth so like at one point i was like you it kind of starts you off slow but you eventually develop the ability to fly at supersonic speeds and i remember just just kind of flying around and like oh hey there's england oh hey there's dubai um like you don't get any place names that pop up but um you can you can tell from the land masses and then at one point like you're because the whole thing is like you're kind of coming into your powers while like for lack of a better term Jarrell kind of talks to you about how oh hey you know you're this powerful being and you're going to save the earth you're going to save the world but you're also going to save the universe here's the ability to fly at mock speeds in outer space and <laughs> there was a point where I'm pretty good at at VR like I haven't I, I think I've maybe the only time I actually got like close to being really sick was playing uh, Doom VFR, just because that game moved so fast to begin with. Mm. Um, but I had a moment with Megaton Rainfall where the, you're like, yeah, you, you can you can now fly off Earth and through the solar system and out into the greater universe, and doing that gave me this like feeling like on a cosmic level that I'm very insignificant because I'm able to fly from earth and like past Jupiter in the blink of an eye and everything. It just, it's, it's weird. It's such a weird little game. And I found that the only way to make it better, not necessarily more palatable, but just better was taking advantage of uh PS4 Spotify and just playing Superman music the whole time. Um, which that actually makes it pretty awesome. So if anybody's looking for like a weird kind of VR game, play Megaton Rainfall with the Superman soundtrack. It's pretty. It's pretty great. Nice. Um, and the second kind of weird one is uh, the American Dream, which is a very like it's it's a piece of satire that is making a comment on America's gun culture but it's done in the style of a carnival ride. So you're sitting in a little car and you have this kind of 1950 style narrator kind of narrating your life from a child to an adult in America where like the gun is praised above all else. At one point you're like, Oh, you just got a summer job flipping burgers and you're flipping the burgers with the gun. Like you're shooting, <laughs> you're shooting these beef patties as they're, as they're cooking on each side. And, uh. and, and like, it's great. But then like, it takes this turn that you would almost like this adult swim style turn that just makes the whole thing so off putting and, and weird. And like, it, it suddenly turns into like an actual shooter game that is awful. 
Um, but again, like as a VR game, you know, the medium lets you do different things. Like it lets you experiment with different, different things. And like, if you, if you want, like, if you want to see like what weirdness looks like in VR, you know, the American dream is one that's, that might be worth looking into. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, that's the nice thing about, you know, the PSVR is right now there's a, there's a wide range of titles. Um, some are good. Some are, you know, maybe not so much, but again, you know, for, I feel like the first couple of years, I think everybody was trying to find their footing with it. Mm -hmm. And now we're getting games like, you know, Astrobot and, and Moss and Resident Evil seven for that matter. Um, and I think pe it's really starting to kind of come into its own and, and, those past couple of years, people would say, should I get a PSVR? But you're like, well, you know, you know, if you've got the money, it's, it's definitely worth looking into. But now I, I, I kind of feel confident in saying that, yeah, you know, if, if someone's wanting a PlayStation VR, you know, yeah, I mean, there's good stuff. I, I can, I can pull a list together of recommended titles that I feel, you know, people would get like their money's worth out of it and the platform or the hardware. That's awesome. Yeah. that's awesome well that makes me excited because that's uh, I feel like that's going to be the next big uh, video game purchase thingy that mm -hmm. I do um, because uh, like I said before I, I feel like it's it's coming to a, a critical mass mm -hmm. it's I mean just everything that you've just said it's at a point where you can actually recommend it uh, for what it is and yeah. what it has available instead of just because it's the new techie thing or because right. of the potential of it. Right. So. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, any uh, any other thoughts on PSVR? Um, um, besides wishing it a happy birthday, which yeah, technically no. its birthday is not until October, but yeah, yeah, it's 2019. It's, it's the third year. It's it's close enough. Yeah. It's, yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's great. There's, uh, you know... Um, I feel that it is a viable purchase. I mean, there's a lot of fun stuff out there. Um, you know, a lot of experimentation being done, but, um, you know, a lot of stuff is also coming from PC. Um, but they're finding ways to make it work and I enjoy it and I am happy to have it. And I look forward to, um, Sony doing more with it. Excellent. Well, Alan, thank you for uh, sitting down with me and chatting about PSVR. Thank you. And absolutely. And we'll be back in just a moment to uh, talk about more video game stuff. Well, that does it for this episode. Thank you so much for listening. You can find more info about the games we discussed, including articles and videos mentioned in the show notes for this episode on darkstation.com, along with the Darkcast Interviews podcast, as well as other video game reviews, previews, and features. Be sure to subscribe to the show on iTunes, follow us on Twitter at darkstation underscore com, find us on Facebook, check us out on YouTube, and email us at podcast at darkstation.com. For Brian Tyler, Joel Zerlup, Jonathan Paris, and Alan Kessinger, I'm Jonathan Miley. Thanks again, and until next time, have a good one. <laughs>